Hello, and welcome to this video where we will discuss our second statistical test, t-tests. So what are t-tests good for? The t-test is useful when you want to compare the results of an experiment to some other value, either some you know, theoretical value or you want to compare the results of two different experiments. In the second case, a t-test is generally more accurate than a z-test as it considers the number of measurements that you use. It, now, if the number of measurements is, is very, very large, then the two will yield similar results. But we need to be into you know, the very large numbers of measurements, hundreds, thousands, that sort of thing. And there are other assumptions that go into the z-test that are actually not present in the t-test that we'll talk about later. So how will we approach our exploration of t-tests? We'll first explore the case of comparing our experimental results to a specific, say, theoretical value, because it's easier to see how the test works in this situation. We'll then generalize to comparing the results of two independent experiments, which is really what we're interested in for this lab. I'm going to point out that there is a what's called a paired version of the t-test, which we will not cover here. The paired t-test is good for experiments that involve a before and after or pre and post some type of intervention or treatment or something. Those types of experiments are very well suited to this paired t-test. I just want to let you know that that's out there and, and you can look it up should you need it for some other purpose. So let's begin by exploring the t-test in the simpler case, where I'm comparing some experimental value, x bar, to some other values, maybe theoretical value, which I'm going to call mu naught. So what is the t-statistic? Well, the t-statistic was formalized, at least in English, by this guy, whose name is William Seeley Gossett. However, he published it under the name student. And the reason he published it under the name student is that his employer, the Guinness Brewing Company, didn't want their uh, researchers to publish under their actual names for, you know, trade secrecy uh, type considerations. And William, William Gossett was interested in the quality of beer with very small samples. And that's where he really got into developing uh, this T statistic. So what is the T statistics? Well, it's somewhat similar to the Z statistic in that it's also the distance between our experimental value and some other value, in this case, some theoretical value, and divided by the standard deviation. Now, in this case, we are using the uh, sample standard deviation. So x bar is the mean result from our sample or experiment. Again, mu naught is the value to which we would like to compare. And s is the sample standard deviation of da our data. And this is an important distinction. In the z test, what you're normalizing by is the population standard deviation. So the, the standard deviation of all the possible values you could get for x bar. And you know, in our discussion on the z-test, we assumed that the standard deviation of the sample is maybe a good estimator for the standard deviation of the population. But the t-statistic doesn't rely on that assumption, which makes it a little bit more useful. And then n is the sample number, or the number of trials, or the size of your sample, you know, this type of thing. So you can see that the number of samples is, is directly taken into account into the t-statistic, which seems like something you should take into account, right? The, the bigger the sample, the more powerful you would expect it to be. So let's see this in action. So I have created a uh, Excel spreadsheet of multiple uh, experiments 
hypothetical experiments with made up data. And in this case, each experiment is made up of two measurements. So I might be, for example, doing the drop a rock experiment. And these are the two values of G that I got from that experiment. And I only dropped the rock twice. So there's only two measurements here. And then I did two measurements, you know, several thousand times. So for each experiment, I can calculate the sample mean, which is just the average, the X bar of these two measurements. You can see it's the average and the sample standard deviation. So the standard deviation of these two values. And then I can go and calculate the T value using the equation that we just talked about, X bar minus mu naught. In this case, I'm comparing to some theoretical value of 9.81 and divided by S divided by the square root of N. So we can see that here in the formula for T, it's taking into account the me sample mean, comparing it to the value I'm interested in, the 9.81, and then dividing it by the sample standard deviation and the square root of the number of measurements. And so then I get a whole bunch of different values for T, one for each experiment. And I replicated this for uh, if I had done five measurements per experiment and 20 measurements per experiment. Okay. So that's what I've done. And now we can see what does the T values look like? So if I've only got the two measurements for each experiment, so I'm in this case here, you know, here's my experiment. I've dropped the rock, say twice, and I've got these two values for G. When I look at all these different values for T and make a histogram of them, here is the result. Now it's a little jagged because I only have like a thousand. Of course, if I had an infinite number, it'd be, you know, a much smoother curve. If I go to five measurements per experiment, I get this result. 20 yields this next result. And then finally, I end up with, I'm plotting on here the normal distribution as well. And so we can see that as the number of measurements gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, the T distribution begins to approach the normal distribution. So as the number of measurements gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, the t-test and the z-test will give more and more and more closer uh, results. However, for any finite number of measurements, there is a difference. And that's the reason for part of the reason for the t-test. And this difference is particularly visible in the tails of the distribution not on the outside. You can see that, that the t-distribution has a lot more area under the tail and less in the middle than the normal distribution, all right? However, just like with the normal, the area under all of these is equal to one by construction. So we can still look at areas and use those for determining p-values. A nice thing about the t-distribution is that you'll notice it's independent of the mean or standard deviation of our experiment. The only thing that matters is the number of data points, which is really where the power comes in. So if I know the number of data points, I know the number of measurements, then that will tell me what my T distribution will look like. And then I can look at areas just like I do in the Z test to determine P values. So let's see how we might use this. So to summarize it up, to sketch out our procedure, 
the first thing we do is we calculate t then we use the fact that the distribution of all the possible values of t depends only on the number of measurements actually what it depends upon is not the number of measurements but what's called the degrees of freedom or df now for simple experiments the number of degrees of freedom is n minus one the minus one is actually related to the minus one that's in the sample standard deviation that we talked about way back in the first lab and that's basically that you need to use the mean to calculate the standard deviation. So you're kind of using some of the data twice. And that's kind of where this minus one comes from. So for simple experiments, it's n minus one, like we're talking about here. And then again, that gets us our t distribution. Once we know the number of degrees of freedom, we know what the t distribution looks like. And we can look at areas to determine probabilities, just like we did with Z. You know, we might look at this area here under the N minus two, something like that, to get a p-value. So let's dig a little bit deeper and do an example, because I think that that will help. So here is one set, one experiment of five measurements of G. And you can see I got five different uh, possible values for G in this one experiment. The mean, the X bar of these five data is 9.8186 Newtons per kilogram. That's just the average of these five things. And then I can use calculate the sample standard deviation for these data points and get 0.4513. Now, if we want to calculate to this theoretical value of G, 9.8100 newtons per kilogram, we can calculate the value of T, right? We can use our sample mean, the theoretical value to which we want to compare, the sample standard deviation, and put five in for the number of measurements to determine a T value. Cool. So now we've got our T value. How can we use this in order to get a P value? Well, we have T. Since there were five measurements, their degrees of freedom is five minus one is four. This is a simple experiment. So the number of degrees of freedom is just one minus the number of measurements. And our T values therefore follow the T distribution with the number of degrees of freedom equal to four. This is again the, the experimental T distribution from uh, this big spreadsheet. And if it were an infinite number, it'd be nice and smooth. I could then ask a couple of different questions. What's the probability of being off this amount or more? Remember the T value is ultimately comparing my measurement to my theoretical value and scaling it by the standard deviation of the sample and the sample size. So T is kind of a measure of the difference between my measurement and this theoretical value I'm interested in. So I could ask, what's the probability of being off by this much or more? This would be an upper tailed t test, and I would be looking at this area here. Remember, the area under the t distribution is equal to one, just like the normal. And so if I looked at that area, that would tell me the probability of being off by this much or more. But just like with the z test, a more likely question would probably be in a lot of circumstances what's the probability of being off at least this much? in either direction. So either high or low. And this would be a two-tailed t-test. So I'd be looking at the area both above and below and adding those two up. Just like with the z-test, only this time it's not a normal distribution. It's a 
t distribution. So how do we do this in a spreadsheet? Well, got it set up here for us to look at. So we've got the t that I've calculated, the number of samples n equal to five, and then the number of degrees of freedom is five minus one for this simple experiment. There are a lot of functions, of course, in our spreadsheet to help us with these things. So t, you can do dot, and then you see t test a bunch of different options. So t dist is going to be the left tail, the low tail. If I wanted to know what's the probability of being off this much or more, that would be a right tail. We see you've got it right here. Don't even have to do anything fancy like I did with the Z. What value do I put in? Well, I put in the T value I've calculated already. And then the number of degrees of freedom and calculate it. And that's the P value. So the probability is just 100 times that, 36.64%. If I wanted to know the what's the likelihood of being off at least this much in either direction, well, then that's the two-tailed t-test. And of course, there's a function for that as well. There's a t-dist 2t. And I can just put in at the t-value we calculated, the number of degrees of freedom, and I get the two-tailed p-value. I convert it to a percentage, it looks like so. And you'll notice that the two t is exactly twice the one tailed, which looking at the distribution, it's symmetric. So it should be a factor of two. So this is a nice little demonstration that everything is working for us. All right. So in summary, the t statistic is the difference between two values in this simple example, the result of our experiment and some theoretical value, scaled by the sample, not the population standard deviation. This is an important distinction between the T and the Z statistics, and the sample size or the number of measurements. The values of T are distributed not in a normal distribution, but instead in this t distribution, which has a little more in the tails than the normal. Now, if the number of experiments gets very, 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 very large, then the difference between the t and the normal kind of disappears. But for realistic sample sizes, the difference can be somewhat significant. So the exact shape of this t distribution, however, doesn't actually depend upon the standard deviation or the mean or anything like that, it only depends upon the degrees of freedom, which is a little weird when you stop to think about it, but it does work out. And for simple measurements, like we've seen here, the number of degrees of freedom is just the number of measurements you've made minus one. And then we can use areas under the T distribution, just like for the Z distribution, to um, determine probability values, all right? So that's the simple case of comparing our experimental result to some theoretical value. What if instead of comparing to a fixed value, I wanna do something much more interesting and compare the results of two different experiments? Well, that's where a slight adjustment to the t-test, student's t-test comes in, and we're gonna use what's called Welch's t-test. So Welch's t-test is the same basic idea. You compare the two values and scale by the standard deviations and number of measurements. So now you've got two different experiments, each with an average value, each with a standard deviation, and each with a number of measurements. And we want to compare these two means and scale it by the standard deviations and the number of measurements. So in this case, we want to compare these two mean values from these two independent experiments, which I'm going to unimaginatively call x bar one and x bar two. And we need some sort of combined standard deviation 
that combines the sample standard deviations of these two experiments, S1 and S2. Now this combined standard deviation is called S delta bar. It's kind of a goofy name, but I don't make up the names. That's what it's called. And it's calculated like this. You can see it's a combination of the sample standard deviations of the two experiments and weighted by the size of the two experiments, right? You want the bigger experiment to, to count for more. And so that's what this is. You can see a sort of combination of the standard deviations of the two experiments. We also need a total degrees of freedom. And this total degrees of freedom needs to be some sort of combination of the sample size of experiment one and experiment two. And this is where I'm finally going to drop a formula and say, this is the answer uh, without a whole lot of justification because it's big and ugly and kind of gross. But this is it. This is how you combine them. Um, you'll probably see how this is done in a more advanced statistics class at some point. But in short, this is the answer. So how would we do this in a spreadsheet? So once again, I have a spreadsheet uh, sort of set up where I've done two independent experiments. In the first experiment, I got an average value of G of 9.8345 and a standard deviation of 0 0.0215. And there were 10 measurement, I mean, 50 measurements, excuse me, in that experiment. For experiment two, I got a slightly lower value of G, uh, a bigger standard deviation, but there were fewer experiments, fewer measurements. One thing that's very important for the Welch's t-test is these two experiments need to be independent of each other. One can't depend on the other. That is quite important. So here are the results of my two experiments. And now we're going to go and uh, calculate the Welch's t-test. The first thing is to calculate this S delta bar. So that's a square root of the standard deviation squared. So power standard deviation squared divided by power v divided by not squared, divided by the number of measurements plus power this standard deviation squared divided by this number of samples. And so there's sort of my combined standard deviation. You can see it's in between the two standard deviations of my two experiments, which kind of makes sense. And it's also closer to experiment one, which also probably makes sense because experiment one has more measurements. And so that one should be a little bit more important. So you can see that this S delta bar is combining the standard deviations of our two experiments in some sort of intelligent way. From here, we can calculate the uh, T value. And that is the difference of the two means, just like we saw here, divided by this S delta bar. And so there is my T value. Now, in addition to being used for the probability, usually you actually quote your t-values in a lot of literature. You, no, you don't just quote the p, you also quote the, the t. So that's why we're always calculating it out. And then we need to calculate this big old degrees of freedom expression, where we combine the number of degrees of freedom of these two results. So this gets a little bit nasty here. So we've got the <clears throat> uh, standard deviation of one squared divided by the sample size of one plus the standard deviation of two squared divided by the sample size of two 
and we're raising all of that to the square. And then we've got our denominator here, which is power of S1 squared divided by the sample size. And then all of this is also squared. So we're going to raise all of that to the square. And very important to keep track of all your parentheses here. And I'm going to divide by the sample size minus one. OK, so there's the first part. And then the second part is following a similar structure, power of C, the experiment two standard deviation squared um, divided by the sample size. And then all of that is also squared. And then we're going to divide that thing by the sample size minus one. And one of the nice things about Excel is it actually highlights the matching parentheses for you. It can help you keep track of all your different parentheses. So there is my big, ugly degrees of freedom expression. And you see I get 29. So we're at least in the same ballpark as these two. Um, it's a little bit less that's actually expected, um, but that is the, the value. Now let's assume that we want to do a two-tailed T uh, test. So T dist 2T. What X do we use? We use the T value we've already calculated, the number of degrees of freedom that we just calculated, and we get a probability. Or if I want to convert it to a percentage, 12.239%. So a little more than 12%. So that's how we would calculate a p-value for two independent experiments with different means, different standard deviations, different numbers of samples, everything. There are simplifications to this process that you can do when you can make the assumption that these two standard deviations are the same or the number of measurements is the same. But this Welch's process works for everything. So to summarize up the Welch's t-test, it's good for comparing two different measurements. And the concept is basically the same as the regular t-test. You measure the difference from your two experiments and scale by some combined standard deviation. These t values will follow a t distribution with the degrees of freedom given by this complex combination of the number of samples from the two experiments. And then we can use this t distribution to calculate the p values and see what is the likelihood that our two experiments are separate independent or representing the same value. This concludes this video.